Hi, I'm Lena. Welcome or welcome back to my channel and welcome to my favorite books of 2023. I had a great reading year, so I have a lot of honorable mentions I want to start with before we start going into the top 10. And even the top 10 has some shared spaces <laughs> because I just could not pick. Let's start with honorable mentions. I have Transcended Kingdom by Yakasi. We will see this author again in the top 10, but this is an honorable mention for now. I had some wonderful romance reads, one of which was You and Me on Vacation by Emily Henry. Another one is a fantasy romance called Heart of the Fae by Emma Hamm. The Street by Anne Petrie was a modern classic that made such a big impression on me. I read the historical fiction by our well-beloved Katie, The Secrets of Hartwood Hall. This was such a great experience to read. It was so incredibly fun as well. Things Fall Apart by Chinua Akebi was a beautiful modern classic. A piece of non-fiction that made a big impression on me was Day Profoundest by Oscar Wilde. One of my favorite myth retellings of the year was Medusa by Jesse Burton. This was so incredibly readable, which I think is very high praise. Another non-fiction that I really enjoyed was Let Me Tell You What I Mean by Joan Didion. A contemporary novel that everyone loved but I also loved is Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. An historical fiction that I've not heard anyone talk about is Shield Maiden by Sharon Emmerich. This is a beautiful historical fantasy which is also a myth retelling but not from a Greek myth but from an Arthurian legend. A romance that I almost forgot that maybe I don't know if it is my favorite romance over you and me on vacation but better than the movies by Lynn Painter was a YA romance, so I guess my favorite YA romance that opened my heart to Lynn Painter as an author. Maybe one of the weirdest books I've read, I'm not going to say the weirdest, but because I read some weird books, is Pot, which I read for the Women's Prize, and that book still really lives within me, even though I did not expect to love it at all. I really, really appreciated it. All right, we have arrived at the top 10 and on number 10 is a shared place for two short stories slash novellas. First one I want to mention is by one of my favorite authors. This is Resetative by Toni Morrison. This is Toni Morrison's only published short story and it is about two girls who have a very similar life. We know that they are of a different race, but we never go into specifics. It is so beautifully written and it so plays beautifully with perceptions of the reader, how race plays a role when you're reading and how your own race determines often how you see characters if an author doesn't define their race. This edition also has a very beautiful introduction by Zadie Smith, who teaches this short story as well. And she says something very poignant about this. If you read this short story, I highly recommend also reading the introduction. It says, when reading recitative with students, there is a moment where the class grows uncomfortable at their own eagerness to settle the question, maybe because most attempts to answer it tends to reveal more about the reader than the character. I find Toni Morrison very clever in the way that she plays with both a reader and characters and their relationship. She is so aware of the relationship that the reader builds with the character, not in a way that she lets it influence her writing, but feel like Toni Morrison was the kind of author who was always aware of everything. This short story is also a great introduction, I feel like, in Toni Morrison's work. If you want to give it a go, if you want to see if it is for you, or if you're just intrigued but don't have... A a lot of time, I mean, I would still very much tell you to read Beloved because that's such an amazing novel, but give this a go if you want to get into Toni Morrison. I'm pairing this short story on number 10 together with a novella by Rachel Ingalls, which is Mrs. Caliban. This is a story about a housewife who is the typical bored housewife. I it's in the 80s, but it feels very 50s. And then there is this monster who is locked up by scientists and he escapes. This monster finds refuge with Mrs. Caliban and they develop both a romantic and a very intense relationship. It has some mystery. It has some weirdness. It's so weird. <laughs> I mean, it's even weirder than Pot. But the writing is so beautiful. The way that the characters are interacting, the way that the characters represent certain elements of society really made me think. And this is one of those novellas that is in its shortness just so, so powerful. On number nine is a very recent read. And this is Slufu by Brom. This is quite a unique pick for my top 10 because it is historical fiction and horror. And I have been loving horror or being fascinated by horror in this last year. But this book is really on here because of the historical fiction part. In Slew Food, we follow a young woman who is born in England and sold to an American by her father because in America they wanted British brides. And we are set in 1616. She has an okay marriage, but then she is widowed. She lives in a Puritan society that is really 
focus on the rights of men. That really diminishes a woman autonomy. She doesn't even have the right to speak and she wants to keep the farm after her husband dies. But her brother-in-law really wants that farm for himself and he tries to use misogyny to get that farm from her. But then we also have a second storyline of a mysterious demon beast devil. Those two storylines start to meld together and it is so eerie but the thing that I love most about this book is that the atmosphere is so strong together with our main character being a very intense character. Overall this book was a really intense reading experience both because I was so sucked in by the atmosphere but also because I cared deeply about our main character. I could understand all of her emotion especially her anger. I got sucked in a story that was so adventurous engaging, horrific and fun at the same time. I'm still having a hard time reviewing a book like this but I know that I will be reading more by Brom because I think he writes historical fiction especially with fantastical elements so incredibly well. On number eight I have a non-fiction and this is a memoir by Rebecca Tolsik called Sitting Pretty. This memoir really beautifully combines life experiences of Rebecca Tolsik together with ideas of disability and ableism. This memoir is an exploration of being disabled in an able-centered world. It really shows the complexity of disability and I found so many things that I could connect my own experiences to but most importantly I got to know Rebecca as a person. I got to know all of her emotions and feelings after experiencing ableism but also just as a human being, her wishes, her dreams. It really got to me. Part of that is because of course she knows so much, she has so much knowledge and experiences but also because she is an amazing writer and I listened to the audiobook which she narrates herself which added so much. There are still stories that she told in her memoir that stay with me. An example of that that is her trying to find a house and she had a limited budget because she was on disability aid. She needed a home that was accessible for her in a wheelchair and that is so much harder than someone who doesn't have to look at that would think. Me personally I don't have to look at that when I'm buying a house or when I'm looking just for a place to live. She really talked about how that interfered with her individuality because she had to move back in with her parents because it took such a long time to find a place to live and I noticed myself when I'm looking for places to stay on vacation or anything that I'm always thinking about this and I'm thinking about how much harder life is when you have certain needs and I also have certain needs because of disability how it is not necessarily the disability itself but the world that makes it harder. This is definitely a memoir that really stayed with me and really deserves the spot on my top 10. On number seven I have a short story collection. There are so many short stories on this list and that is my favorite read of October this year which is Cotton Phyllis and Other Stories by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a collection of short Victorian stories that all are so adventurous and insane and have such beautiful characters that I lift in every single short story and I find it so masterful when every short story in a collection is so strong that you feel everything that happens, that you experience the characters, that you care about what happens to them. And this is I think maybe the best short story collection I have ever read. Of course part of that is because the amazing writing of Elizabeth Gaskell, another part of that is the way that this collection was collected. <laughs> of course there's an editor who decided which short stories should go in there and in which order, although I didn't read them in order to be honest. I still don't know which short story would be my favorite. The first one wasn't my favorite starting out but now that is the short story I think about most. It's the kind of short story that feels like a mini novel, not like a snippet or an element of a bigger story but you feel like every short story has a beginning, middle and end with a lot of characters, all of them. Basically all these short stories are breaking the rules what makes a good short story for me in general which is preferably not more than three characters preferably in one location and just one period of time those are usually my favorite short stories the simpler the better these break all of those rules and still i loved it so much i think it is just masterfully written how you can make a whole embodied emotional dramatic story in so little pages. Yeah it's either Lizzie Lee or The Manchester Marriage that I really really love so if you would like to read a short story by Elizabeth Gaskell. Also The Old Nurse's Tale is more gothic would also highly recommend but I didn't read that this year. I would recommend one of these but of course I am going to recommend the whole collection because it was really really good. On number six we have The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell which is another book I read for the Women's Prize. This drew me 
in. <laughs> in this book we follow Lucretia. She is 16 years old and she is married to a very vile, unkind man. There's nothing good about him. I think in the beginning he seems okay, but then the more we get to know him, the closer he gets to Lucretia, the more we start to hate him. And there are two storylines in this book. One is just her being a child, growing up, going towards this marriage. And the other one is her being in this marriage and thinking that she has been poisoned by her husband. Because we are set in... Oh gosh, why do I not remember this? We are set in Italy in... Is it 16 something? 15 something? It's Renaissance Italy. Apparently it was quite common for noblemen in this time to poison their wives so that they could get a new wife, could get a new political marriage, which is gruesome. Even though you know what is going on in the beginning, the build up towards that and getting all the answers, it was amazing. I really loved the writing. It's the epiphany of readable and beautiful at the same time. I wouldn't call this the perfect book because I think there were some elements that were less perfect for me. I think there was some slowness within, if I remember right, I think it was the middle of the book, but because I was so incredibly hooked and I cared so much about the, especially the main character, it was just great. There is something quite controversial in the ending and I think it is worth mentioning and thinking about that when it comes to class, this book can be a bit controversial in multiple ways. I think there are more layers and I'm not sure if it's just an oversight of the author or if it's something done on purpose and you really need to take a beat to think about how you feel about the ending, which is all, all I'm gonna say. I would highly recommend this. It's such an easy read. It's really one of those books that if you're in a reading slump, would highly recommend. On a joint fifth place, I have two non-fictions that made me think, broke my heart, did all the things. One that I want to mention is a book that I found super hard to read, but I'm really glad that I did. And that is The Unwomanly Face of War by Svetlana Alexievich. This is about Russian women fighting the Second World War. It's about their experiences, about what they remember. The entire book is basically a collection of vignettes, of interviews that the author did with these women. Mm, it's, it's not beautiful, but it's beautiful to see how memory works and how people remember different things, but also how the culture of the current day influences certain memories. Some of these women have a big layer of patriotism around or on top of their memory and other women do not, are more nuanced. Also how their husbands think about the war, who also fought in the war, how their experience are usually more elevated than the experiences of their wives. And it's often told that they should not be talking about it anymore because it's not very womanly. This was super interesting, but very hard to read. And then another book that was also hard to read, the writing was a bit easier or just the structure of the book was easier. And that is The Five by Helly Rubenhold. This is about five women that were supposedly killed by Jack the Ripper. It's about their lives from all the documents that we have about them. And Helly Rubenhold really tries to weave it into a narrative, not in a way that it feels like fiction. It's very much non-fiction fiction but it's so interesting because not only do we get a face, a name, a voice to people that have turned into myths but we also get so much information about Victorian London especially when life wasn't very peachy for you. It discusses the workhouse, it discusses marriage, it discusses sex work and it gives such a nuanced overview of all these things which I think misses a lot when we romanticize the Victorian era that one person is not just one thing but every single person has a life, has nuance, has more to them than just one title or one idea of what a Victorian character is like. These were of course not characters but real people. I'm confident in saying that as far as non-fiction go the writing was just perfection in this book. Number four is also a shared space but that is because we have one and two in a series and this is a fantasy. This is the first time I'm putting fantasy on my top 10 and that is I got beautiful editions of them, Her Majesty's Royal Coffin and the Shadow Cabinet. So this is number one, this is number two. So I will talk about number one because number two, I cannot talk about that, of course. Her Majesty's Royal Coffin follows four friends who are witches in our contemporary world and they are part of Her Majesty's Royal Coffin, which is an organization of witches in England or in the UK, not just England. We follow all of their perspectives as they encounter a young witch who is wreaking a lot of havoc and who needs to be taken care of. The way that that is supposed to be done, they disagree on. Especially two of the characters really highly disagree on it. The farther we get into this book, the more epic it becomes. And we follow these characters who are also layered and interesting and especially one character discusses a big political 
issue. That character embodies or is a comment, I think, to me it was, on an author who also wrote very famous magical books. The Shadow Cabinet is book number two and we also get book number three. I don't know exactly my ratings of these books. I don't know if I gave both of them five stars. Maybe I gave the first one a five and the second one a 4.5. I enjoyed them both equally. The second book is always you want a little bit more. You're waiting for the other book to come out. I listened to the audiobooks of these ones, which is narrated by an amazing narrator, by an actress whose name I always forget. I would highly recommend the audiobooks because she does the voices of every character so well. This is definitely my favorite ongoing fantasy series. Um, it is low fantasy, which I think is one of the reasons that I love it very much. It discusses a lot of social issues. There's not always a lot of place for that in fantasy, but because this is low fantasy set in our contemporary world, there's so much that we experience ourselves, we see ourselves, and this is especially targeted towards the UK, that there is space to explore that. Next to following those four friends who are all in their late 30s, or early 40s, maybe it's like a switch. <laughs> I think they're in their late 30s. We also follow some of their children, some teens, which gives some coming of age elements to these books as well, which I'm really enjoying. Cannot wait for the third book. I don't think we have to wait very long anymore. I will definitely get another hardback copy. Tragically, another one of my favorite series that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. I don't have copies of them yet, but I will. Book number three, I also don't own, but I will in the future, although I think the book is now sold out in most places. And that is Damon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. This is a David Copperhead retelling, mostly set in the late 90s. This won the Women's Prize, so I'm not being super original by putting this on my list, but I did a vlog for the Women's Prize and this was my favorite of them all. So we follow Damon, who has, I wanna say, a similar life to Charles Dickens, his David Copperfield. You are set in an impoverished town in the US. Lot wise, Damon is a lot like David, but it's all set in our world. So different elements play a big role in this. Family plays a really big role, the same way it does in David Copperfield. Poverty looks very different, while it also really looks the same. This is one of those books that I would say is written perfectly, which I don't say easily, but this book is just written perfectly because the way that the plot is based, the way that the characters are written is just absolutely absolute perfection. This is one of those novels that is big but deserves every single page. Not for one second was I bored while reading this. Damon goes through a lot of things, a lot of poverty, drugs, opportunity is so painfully accurate. Not necessarily to the world that I see but the world that I know exists these days and has existed in the 21st century and it really made me think of the fact that we romanticize poverty in a historical perspective, in a perspective that is very far away from us but the story of Damon Copperhead is actually uh, to someone like me much closer than maybe I am willing to admit. The fact that you would read a book like David Copperfield with such a distance, like those were horrible times, but luckily we have changed. This book very much questions that. It looks different, but is it better? Is it worse? It's very interesting questions to ask, and this was a very deserved winner for the Women's Prize for me personally. On number two is a series continuation. So we have book two and three, which I read this year, which I read very wide apart. I think I read two in the spring and three I just finished, and that is the Wolf Den series by Elodie Harper. My favorites, I gave them both five stars. The Wolf Den I also gave five stars, so every installment in this series I gave five stars, but I'm talking about the House of the Golden Door and the Temple of Fortuna. These are slow, character-based historical fictions set in Pompeii. We follow Amara, who is a sex worker, an enslaved sex worker, in a brothel in Pompeii when we meet her. We follow her throughout book two and three as her life and location, everything evolves, changes, and we follow Amara as she tries to survive as she tries to make the right decisions for her and for the people that she loves. I cannot say much more of course about the plot because we're sticking to the first book <laughs> description wise but both the second and the third book did not disappoint in any way. It surprised me. There are things that happened in the second book that had a very curious and unexpected outcome in the third book. I love the writing. I know a lot of people also don't like this series. It's a bit of a hit or miss with people, but I think if you enjoy the same kind of historical fiction as I do, I would highly, highly recommend. Again, it is slow. It is definitely one of those books that I listen to on audiobook and that I take my time with. 
Although the tempo of Fortuna, the second half, I listened to in one or two days because I just I needed to know how this series was going to be wrapped up. But this series had one of those endings that I just found unexpected but worked so well for me. This series had a lot of things that I felt like, is the author going to go there? Is she doing this? Is this actually happening? And the answer was yes, every time. I want to say so much more about this series, but I'm afraid that it might contain spoilers. So go ahead, give the first book a go. And if you like the first one, I will promise you that two and three will not disappoint. All right, and then we have arrived at my favorite book of the year. And this is probably not a surprise to anyone, but here it is. This is Homegoing by Yagasi, which was not published at all in 2023, but it is my favorite book of the year. This tells a big generational story and we start with two women. One of the sisters is enslaved and sent to the US and the other sister stays in Ghana and we follow their descendants. Every chapter has its own descendant and we switch between the two families. The setup of this book is already so interesting. The core material just works but the way that Yagasi wrote this is just mind-blowing. I think I had a little mini crisis of emotion after every chapter. Of course, there were certain characters that I felt more attached to, but I think I mentioned Elizabeth Gaskell and how she had all those short stories that usually just break the rules of what I love. And I had the same with Homegoing. I usually don't love it to be ripped out of the story and to be followed up by a new character, a new storyline. That is just not usually how I'm able to enjoy a novel, but it worked so, so well on Homegoing. Of course, this is a generational story, so we do get to know kind of what happens to other characters, true stories of the newer generation. The writing was just absolute mind-blowing. Like I need Yakasi to write more because Transcendent Kingdom, while I didn't love it as much as Homegoing, it was so good as well. It feels like every character has such an emotional presence um, in themselves. It's very complicated, very accessible to us as a reader. And I feel like that is such a difficult but beautiful thing if a writer can do that, especially if there are so many characters like there are in Homegoing when every character is so complex but really easy for you as a reader to discover. And the writing is not on the nose. It's not like telling, it's very much showing. Hard to talk about my favorite book of the year, but this was just so, so good. And I'm not the only one who absolutely adores this book, who just appreciates its value so, so much because this is, of course, a highly popular book. Thank you for everyone who told me that I would really, really love this. Those are my favorite books of 2023. Do we have any books in common? Let me know. I am very excited to start my reading for 2024. This list does not have a whole lot of classics. And if you have been following my channel for a while, you know that I usually read a lot of classics. But this year it was a goal of mine to just read everything and anything. And I think it had a result of me just enjoying my reading a lot. I am getting more into classics in the new year. Be ready to expect that. There's also more reason that I'm doing that because I'm working on something really really big right now i am trying to make a dream come true currently um i'm not writing a book <laughs> just i feel like when a booktuber says that they're writing a book i'm not writing a book i'm not a writer but i'm doing something else i am nervous but mostly incredibly exciting and i will share that with you when i'm ready to do that it will be soon though for now thank you so much for watching this video i will be doing some statistics about my reading early in the new year but for now i wanted to share my favorite books of the year i hope that you have a lovely lovely day or evening and i also hope that you have a really great festive season Doei.